Uh, good evening everyone, uh, we'll get started on the race management seminar. So we've got Charlie Manzoni here to present this evening. And as you know, Charlie's been quite instrumental in raising the level of our race management at the Yacht Club. So uh, I'll let him go through the uh, slides. Um, if you are interested and you haven't already been involved in what the club is doing to get people on grade one and grade two as race officer courses, uh, then two, let me know. And you know, we put you on the interest list for the next time the courses are run. Can you hear? No. If you, if you do struggle hearing, you can. There is a lot of hearing. Hello. That much better. Okay. Right. Well, I better use the microphone then. Um, uh, my name is Charlie Manzoni. You'll see this is the RYA course, um, which I, I'm afraid just lifted off the website. It started off at 80 slides. I managed to get it down to 60. Um, and I'm going to get through them in 45 minutes, so we're not quite sure it's going to be an interesting day. Let me tell you first of all what I'm not going to do. What I'm not going to do is just simply run through the club procedures. Because I think you can all read those, there are plenty of documents on the books that tell you the club procedures. What I'm going to do is run through a little bit of the, sort of, a little bit of the theory and the way these things work in practice, rather than actually um, uh, the club procedures. Um, the first thing is to get this working. No? Okay, I'll stand here. You may as well see it. The, the first thing is, um, uh, what is the sort of structure? Because there is in fact an international structure of race officering, or race management. Um, it starts off in the, in, in the UK with a club race officer, uh, which is basically what we're, what we're doing here. And this is this level. Is, this is then it goes up to a regional race officer. That's a guy who's attended a, 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 a quite a long seminar, a couple of days seminar, to get the theory right, um, and got a bit of experience. Then it goes up to a uh, national race officer in the UK, that's the level I'm at. Um, you've got to attend two seminars and got quite a lot more experience, and that's basically the highest national level, and then it goes into international race officer. We are trying to introduce a similar structure into the club, um, and uh, we, you know that's the way of improving the quality of race management that we've got. We're trying to introduce a structure similar to this. The next important point to understand about race management is it really is race management. It's not all about being the race officer. Um, here is a list of the people, all of whom, apart from the beach master and, uh, well, even safety officer on the water, but apart from the beach master, all of these people are critical people to running successful race management. You really do need, the PRO is called the Principal Race Officer. Um, that's actually a position which only applies when you've got more than one course area. So you don't need to worry too much about that. The Race Officer is the guy who's running the racing on an individual course. The DRO, or the Deputy Race Officer, is the guy who can stand in when the Race Officer falls off the back, or you know, gets ill, or whatever can happen. He runs, he's basically running the boat. So he's running the committee boat. The race officer is standing around looking at what's going on, trying to keep the team running, watching the racing, etc. The, 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 the deputy race officer is running the boat, making sure the flags go up, etc., all that kind of stuff. The assistant race officer is usually on the pin end boat or on the other end of the finish. Um, pin end boat is obviously very important, in a, certainly in a big regatta, because you want to be able to see the, if you've got a, a, a boat coming in close to you. You can't see all the other boats that are over the line, so you want the guy at the pin end, and you're in constant communication with him. Um, visual signals, that's the flags. That's very important, because if that goes wrong, you've got a problem. Uh, the gunner is the, the, the sound person, uh, usually combined with the timekeeper. Um, recorders are critical. They're the people that write everything down. Um, pin end crew, again, finish boat crews. So it's all absolutely critical, and you can see that everybody is doing an important job. One of the things that we want to encourage here is to sort of dispel the myth that it's all just about being a race officer, because it is, all of these jobs are critical, and actually, when you get to a big regatta, like the, I mean, not even the Olympics, but a World Championship, for example, you may well have three or four international race officers, a couple of national race officers, a couple of international mark layers and national mark layers, all in the same race management team. And they're all doing different jobs within the team. And that's how it becomes a successful, uh, a successfully run um, 
uh, Regatta and Wend. So what we're introducing is the whole concept of race management rather than the concept of just being the race officer. Next thing, that's just the, the team, really. Um, next thing I want to talk to you about a little bit is the wind. Because everybody, when they get into the committee boat for the race officer, they stand on the anchor committee boat and they hold the flag up and they say, where's the wind coming from? And the question, is that the right thing to do? Or is it not the right thing to do? So, what we're going to look at just for a second is we're going to look at the wind. The ground wind is what you get when you stand here at Middle Island. I've got a wind coming in at me from just over here. That's the ground wind, because I'm standing still. I'm not moving. The wind is just coming towards me. That's the ground wind. There's no tidal current on the, um, uh, on the thing. So what it is, is you imagine a boat. The ground wind is coming down towards the boat without tidal current. And it's measured from a fixed point on the ground of the anchor committee boat. OK? That's known as the ground wind. It's quite an important concept. The next question is, well, what happens when there's a tide running? Okay, so you've got no gradient wind or no ground wind, but you've got a tide, in this example, going from left to right. Well, you end up with what's called the tide-induced wind. So if you can imagine, you're in a boat, and it's moving this way because of the tide, you're going to feel wind on this cheek because the boat's going that way. That's called a tide-induced wind. And that is something, obviously, that all the boats that the sailors are sailing are going to experience. So the tide-induced wind is quite an important thing. Then what happens is the gradient wind kicks in. Okay, so not only have you got a tidal wind, but you've got a gradient wind. And that gives rise, those of you who can remember your maths back from those days at school when you used vectors, that gives rise to what we call sailing wind. And as you can see from there, because you've got a ground wind coming down this way, you've got a tide-induced wind coming this way, the sailing wind is going to be somewhere in the middle. Okay? And the question is, what, do you, what are the sailors experiencing? Well, the answer is the sailors are experiencing the ground wind. And that's the important wind as far as race management is concerned. So the sailing wind is a wind experienced by a free-floating boat which is stopped in the water. Now, from a race management perspective, that's quite important. Because the question you've got to ask yourself is, how do I measure where the sailing wind is? And the, the immediate answer is, the second you get out to the area, you don't drop the anchor in the committee boat, you float around for a bit. And you're going to float on the tide, you've got the gradient wind, you've got the tide and juice wind, you're going to experience the sailing wind. So when you're going on a free-floating committee boat, and this is one of the reasons you need to get out there early, when you're going to sit on a free floating committee boat and you hold your compass up and your flag and you're trying to work out where it's coming from, what you're actually experiencing then is the same thing. The moment you drop your anchor, you will see that it shifts by sometimes five, actually about nine degrees in one of the time. So it's quite a significant shift. Um, and uh, it also explains why, when you're sitting on your committee boat and you think you've got a wind coming at, let's say, 180 degrees, and you ask the guy up at the top of the course what wind direction have you got, he's in a rig, floating free, he's got a different wind. And that's usually, or often at least, because he's experiencing the sailing wind. The other way that you do it, of course, is also that you look at the sailing boats. Uh, and they're, they're, I mean, they are the critical factor. So you see, um, uh, quite often, race officers standing on the foredeck of a committee boat with their compass looking up the transom of the boat. And he said, well, what course is he sailing? And if you can get a course that the boats are sailing on either tack, upwind, then that's giving you a pretty good angle on the sailing wind. You also, of course, have a look at how they're crossing your line. Are they coming across at 45 degrees? And that gives you a good angle on your line. So you're using all these factors to try to judge the wind that the sailors are in fact experiencing. The next thing is, and I'm, I'm going to rush it because this is a fairly significant course, and if anybody's got any questions, just chuck your hands up because. Um, happy to answer. Um, next thing we need to look at is the courses as far as race management is concerned. What is it that we're looking for out of a course and, and important factors of, uh, affecting what it is that we're doing? Obviously what we want is clean winds. Now in the harbour, sometimes quite difficult to, to achieve. On the south side, it's also sometimes quite difficult to achieve. 
And we've all experienced, I suspect, on the south side, the wind coming around one side of the mountain, and then it dies off, and then it picks up, and it comes around the other side of the mountain at about 45 degrees different angle. So you're trying to achieve clear wind. So when you're actually going out to the race area, what you're trying to find is a race area where you can achieve those clean winds as best as possible. It doesn't always happen. An even depth of water, that doesn't normally apply in Hong Kong, but it's very significant if you're running races in, in estuaries or in the Solent or in places where there are significant sandbags. So you're trying to get an even depth of water, and the reason for that is because the water runs um, faster with the currents in deep water than it does over shallow water. So the, if you've got an uneven depth of water across your racetrack, you're going to be naturally favouring one side of your racetrack. Minimal tidal currents, obviously. Um, in some respects, minimal tidal currents, um, what you're actually looking for is an equal tidal current. You can't always get out of it, but what you really want is an equal tidal current across the, across the race course rather than an uneven tidal current across the race course. You also need enough space. This is often, certainly in Hong Kong, you see it happen quite a lot, um, that uh, race boats or race uh, committee boats go out, they think, oh, that's fine, and you look up and that's fine. And then you find that the windward mark, when you want it to extend a little bit, is only about 50 yards off the shore. And that gives you all sorts of problems. So you need enough space. You need to work out roughly how long your course is going to be, work out where your top mark should be, and therefore work out that you've got enough space. And also, course area is not overlapped. That is an issue when we have, um, when we have other clubs racing. The classic course, um, is the windward lure. Now, obviously, in the harbour, we generally do what's probably known as round the cans. It's not quite round the cans, because they're around um, inflatable boys, but they're always in the same place. So um, it's almost round the cans for racing. Uh, for south side racing, or dinghies, and up in Shelter Cove as well, we also do um, uh, sort of laid courses, which personally I think are better. They certainly do better racing. And the classic one is. Um, uh, the windward lure. It's relatively easy. It's probably, from a race management perspective, the easiest one to lay because you've only got one windward lure to, 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 uh, to worry about. Um, the alternatives are, depending on the um, uh, how long you want the race, you can uh, obviously you can you can vary the length of the course. And as a race manager, a race officer, you can actually vary it during the course of the race. And when you get up into the higher levels of race management, you learn how to do that and how to time the races all accurately and probably so you can actually work it out. But you could just do more rounds. You can start here, you can finish up at the top to give yourself um, one extra beat, or you can uh, uh, or you can finish down the bottom, which gives you a downwind finish. So there's various different ways that you can do it. They're generally known as, uh, as W1 and W2, depending on the number of beats that there are. We, um, we haven't quite got our naming convention in accordance with the ISAF policy yet in Hong Kong, but we, we're getting there. Um, w1 means it's a windward and there's one beat. So it's not really a race. You go up once and you come back and you finish. W2, uh, it means that it's a windward and there is two beats. And that's basically the way that, that, that ISAF now do it. That's because sailors are obviously a bit thick and they got confused by the word lads because uh, everyone used to call it two laps, but it's no longer two laps, it's now two beats, because then everybody knows how it works. The gate, and uh, we're starting to introduce gates in Hong Kong now because they're used all over the world pretty much. The gate, this is pretty, pretty critical, I'll tell you how you lay that in a moment, but you lay it square to the sailing wind, and that's one of the reasons why you need to know where the sailing wind is. Equally, and we'll come to it in a minute, you lay the start and finish, or well, certainly the start line, you lay square to the sailing wind, not square to the ground. The next course is a sausage triangle. That used to be the old Olympics course, um, and there are various alternatives for it. I believe the 515 still use it as one of their preferred courses. Some boats like it. It gives you windward lure, which is generally, I, I'm outside the bias, but it's generally speaking the best racing is windward lure. But also, it gives you a nice reach um, from here to here, and then a jive, and then another reach from there to there. And uh, one of the boats like that, because it, it can improve, or at least it can give you good boat handling moments when it's blowing, because you've got a tight reach with spinnakers. Um, the 
So we do use it in the China coast, actually, on China coast regatta sometimes, because there's quite a lot of big boats that actually like reach. Um, it's sort of fun and fun, so I think it's the way they think. But there's not many tactical options on a reach, which is why, from a racing perspective, it's probably not really good. You can change your angles, and that changes the geometry of the course. If you imagine, naturally, because this is the start, you go into the wiggle mark, wind's coming down the thing. So if you change that internal angle to 60 instead of 70, you're going to get a broader sail on the, um, uh, on the, on the first clinical reach. So that's the sort of variation that you can take on, uh, uh, on a triangle. Um, you could also put the finish downwind of Mark 3 instead of upwind of Mark 1. Of course, some of the uh, benefits of doing that is that you need less resources, because if you've got a separate finish boat, you need a finish boat, finish crew, etc., etc. If you've got less resources, and that's one of the things you have to think about when you're picking courses, is how many resources you've got um, to do. The trapezoid course is the most common dinghy course, actually, apart from on 29ers, now they only use Wimbledon. It's basically two Wimbledon. The beauty of the trapezoid course is it allows you to run a lot of classes, which is why we use it in all the dinghy classes. Because what you do is you have an inner loop, which, is, which they start here, they go round, up, and then out and finish. That's called an inner loop an I1, an I2, or an I3, depending on how many beats be you've got. Or you have an outer loop, which is where you generally send the faster courses, and they go up, round, it's the blue, and then round and finish. And if you've got enough resources, there's a couple of variations on this, if you've got enough resources for a separate start and a separate finish, it has a great advantage that as soon as the fast boats are finished, you can get them to sail back over here, and you can start them again. So it means you can keep a rolling program of racing running when you've got a lot of classes. The difficulties with the course are that you're sitting as the race officer here on this one, and it's very difficult to monitor what is actually going on in terms of the wind on the outer loop. So what you do is you put your most experienced mark layer at the top of the outer loop, and you tell him to monitor. It's also, if you're having to move the course, it's quite difficult. There's a, there's a sort of set geometry to these things. If you have to move, if the wind shifts and you've got to move it, there's quite a lot of marks to move, so it can get quite complicated. If the shift is only small, you can just move one or the other of the legs. Uh, one, one, you can either move mark, mark two or mark one um, a little bit more easily, or sometimes mark three. Notice the mark designations, this is pretty standard mark designations that you just count around one, two, three, and four, and, and that's quite helpful because um, if we all use the same, then we all know what we're talking about. So when I say, can you move mark three, everybody knows what, you know, old John in the rib doesn't say, Who, who's mark three? Because everybody knows who mark three is, because it's a standard sort of designation. The other alternative we use for this quite often at the Yacht Club, because we haven't got a separate start finish boat is you can put mark five down here and so you bring them down mark three round mark five and then back up through a finish line which is normally on that side of the uh, of the start boat. so you've got a separate start finish you can have the finish just coming through this way i, I have seen it run once as an hps regatta, a bit of a disaster where some people were finishing this way and some people were finishing that way but there you go. we won't say any more about that um, that's the trapezoid course. It's two parallel, um, two parallel wooden lures, and again, you can alter the internal angle depending on the sort of boats that you use. And there is, there's a pretty standard geometry. If you, any of those people who are interested in mark laying, I mean, I can tell you sort of, sort of almost off the top of my head what the angle from the committee boat to mark two is if the wind angle is 25 degrees, that sort of thing. You look it up on a spreadsheet. It's all very standard. You don't need to worry about that too much. The only thing you need to try and work out, basically, is how long is your wind leg going to be. Because that will determine, effectively, your race length. Round the cam's course. Let me just see what this one says. I'm just going to put them all up. 
and it's easy. This is effectively what we do in the harbour, although they're not strictly around the cans. If you race in the UK, um, it's sort of around the cans is classic in Solent Harbour, in the Solent or in Chichester Harbour, where they're laid navigation marks or laid marks used by lots and lots of clubs is very often what happens. We don't really have that in Hong Kong. Um, but it gives you a, a, a whole mix of, of options. Personally, I'm not sure that the, the, the racing is quite as good because you don't very often get a pure beat. Um, your downwind legs aren't usually as accurate and the racing probably isn't quite as good, but it's a lot easier really to set. Um, the downwind leg, uh, and I'm going to be talking mainly now about the courses that you lay rather than around the cans. The downwind leg is the most important leg. It's sort of slightly contrary to the way most people think. It is not the upwind leg that is the most important, it's the downwind leg. And that is particularly so as the wind increases. And the reason for it, there is a mathematical reason for it, but if you're interested, we can go into it. And, but, I mean, it's absolutely clear. But if you basically, um, if you start down here, and you go up there, and when, when you're going upwind, you've got a tacking angle of 90 degrees, you can see immediately, if you've got an absolutely perfect beat, you're going to draw a triangle. You do one tack on either side, you're going to draw a triangle. And that gives you what you call your field of play in race management terms, of course, you give you a field of play. And anywhere within that triangle, all the boats are pretty equal, okay? On the downwind leg, generally the jiving angles are much, much smaller, so your field of play is much, much narrower. Now imagine that we've drawn a perfect diamond shape on that screen with a perfect wind. Then what happens is that you skew the top of the diamond. And what that has the effect of doing is, is, is squeezing down the, the width of the diamond and it closes down what we call your field of play. And you end up with a much smaller um, area where you can legitimately tack as a boat or jump as a boat. Upwind, when you do it, uh, and the classic is it's about 60% on one giant, 40% on the other. And when we set to the sailing wind, that's generally about the way, the area that it works. Downwind, if you've got five degrees off, you've narrowed the field of place at almost zero on a downwind leg. So that's why the downwind leg is the most critical leg to get right. And a lot of people don't understand that, and that's where you've got to work. So you'll see the race officers, generally speaking, there are two things they watch for. Getting upwind, the race officer is watching to see how many fleets go one side and how many boats go one side and how many boats go the other. If he's got an equal split of boats going both ways, he's generally pretty happy because he's had a fairly accurate upwind leg. What he's looking for on the downwind leg, ideally, is two boats coming downwind on opposite jives parallel to each other because then he knows he's got an absolutely accurate downwind leg. If the boats aren't jiving at all, he's had a crap downwind. Again, you know you've got a problem. If you've got the boats jiving about halfway down, you know you've got it about right. And that's what you're looking for as a, as a race officer, is you're watching the boats to see. Now, if you suddenly see that none of the boats have jived, you've got to be thinking about changing your course because your downwind leg isn't right. That's if you've set it an up and down. Tidal compensation. This is something that nobody really does until they're actually taught it. And it's actually a, a very difficult thing to do. Now, again, there's a lot of mathematics behind this. It's all to do with vectors. And it's all to do with, we've already mentioned tidal wind. But also the boats get affected by tide. So the boat will move with the tide as well. So that can increase or decrease the effect of the tidal wind. And it has a very significant effect. So if you assume that you have got um, wind one and wind two, you've got 12 knots of wind coming down, you've got one knot of tide, okay? Basically, the question is, where do I set the windward mark? I've got one knot of tide going from left to right, you know, at 90 degrees to my course, at 90 degrees to the wind. The question is, what do I do about that tide? Where do I set my mark? And it's amazing how much difference it makes. The answer is 15 degrees off the wind, okay? 
And that is the rule of thumb. In greater than 10 knots of wind, with one knot of tide, set the windward mark down tide 15 degrees of the ground wind. It's a significant amount. In two knots of tide, it's 30 degrees. And you know, you sit there and you look at this, and that's where the wind is, that's where I put the mark. No, I'm going to put it over there. And the reason is because the boats are moving as they, essentially, because the boats are moving as they go up the wind of the lake. Um, and uh, that's how you get your better beat. So that's your rule of thumb. In less than eight knots, and one knot of tide, the offset is 20 degrees. Okay? So it gets bigger, obviously, because the boats won't move more, because they're on the beach longer. And the tide is diagonal to the wind, you halve the allowance. That's basically how you assess it. That's a rule of thumb. I'm not going to go through all the maths, it's far too complicated for this time of night. In two knots of tide, you double the allowance. Now all you really need to take out, and if you want to know the rule of thumb, there it is. But all you really need to take out is, you often hear people just say, oh, we've got a bit of a tide offset. And that's what they're doing. They're allowing down tide for the tide offset for the boats. We did it, I think, probably for the first time in the China Coast regatta this year, and it, it significantly reduced, I'm told, the tactical bias of going left and long during the course of the regatta. Lure leg, the answer is pretty standard, no matter what the wind strength, five degrees down tide is what you set for an accurate wind, a lure leg. Okay, any wind, five degrees down tide. Now that, of course, gives you a bit of a problem because how do you set it 15 degrees down tide for the windward leg and 5 degrees down tide for the lure leg? Because you can, do, you, you can already see what the problem is going to be because if I've only got two marks, that's my windward leg, I need my, tide, I need my lure leg down here. So immediately you've got a problem and that's, it, it always is going to be a problem. If you can use a tidal offset, that's what we sometimes do. We use offsets for two reasons. One is to separate fleets with fast boats coming down, but the other reason, when we're sailing in tide, it, or laying courses in tide, is to, to create a tidal offset. And if you get the tidal offset right, you get a perfect beat, and you get a perfect downwind leg. And that's a good, that's a good course. A um, couple of other compromises. When you've got two of the basic compromise, and there's all sorts of sort of, you know, swanky things you can do with, 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 with tidal correction legs. But the basic compromise it is that we equally, we set up on the sailing wind, which gives us a pretty much an equally skewed um, course. And that's what we do when we only have two marks. And in Hong Kong, frankly, that's probably the simplest thing to do. That, that is what gives you 60% on one tack and 40% on the other, basically. So that's why the sailing wind is the, is the critical thing to try to find out, rather than just sitting there and measuring the wind on the coast. So that gives you, hang on, there's a bit of a thing here. Oh no, that's the end of it. Um, so you can see from here, what you've done is you're, you, you've got your ground wind, you've got your tide induced wind, which gives you a sailing wind, so you just set the course up parallel to the sailing wind, and that'll give you the, the, the sort of relatively easily skewed or equally skewed course. It's not perfect, but it's about as good as you can get. And if the sailors complain, then I can, frankly, they're not going to complain. I've never had them complain on the sailing wind. Okay, so that's the course. So you've decided your course, and the critical thing for a race officer is you've got to try and think well, how long is, how long is my race? How long do the guys want to be out there? How long have I got? Um, and consequently, how long should I set the course? Now, there are a whole series of ways to do that. The, the simple answer, frankly, is talk to the classes, if you don't know. Um, talk to the, if, if you're setting courses for dinghies, you talk to the coaches. If you happen to know um, me or, you, or somebody who's done all the courses, there, is, there, there, there are ways to tell. We can, we, we can calculate from empirical data, from the uh, IRC handicaps, from all sorts of things, we can calculate almost to within the minute how long a race is going to last in any set of given wind conditions. So we know pretty much, and from the length of the course, we can, or from, from the speed data that we've got, 
we can tell you pretty accurately how long your uh, your legs are going to be. But in terms of just doing it at a club level, the answer is ask around, ask the classes, they will know how long they need, they will know how long their winning the mark should be. And the coaches, certainly for the kids down the south, on, on the south side, they know very well how long the thing should be because they're doing it every weekend. So that, but that's one of the critical things you've got to decide when you're saying, setting um, uh, setting the of courses. The next thing you've got to decide is what am I going to do with the start line? And again, that is critical because if the start line length is too long, it's boring and it's dull, and you're probably giving somebody, because you're bound to have a little bit of bias on it, you're going to be giving somebody a big advantage. If it's too short, you're going to really upset everybody because there's no room for them to come in. And there's going to be all sorts of mayhem on the boat. So the question is what is the start line length? And the answer, strictly, is the number of boats on the start line at any given start times the length of the boat plus 10 to 50 percent. Okay? The ISAF recommends a factor of 1.3 to 1.5, so it's plus 30 to 50 percent. Personally, I use 50 percent. So I measure the length, I, if there's 14 etchels, I work out 14 times 30 feet, multiply by one and a half, and then usually add just a little bit. Okay, that's basically the way that I do it. And it seems to work. On the committee boat, you should find, if it's not already there, you should find a laser rangefinder. And what you do is you put it's like a golf rangefinder. You point it at the pin end, and it'll tell you how far away it is. And it's very accurate, and it's very useful. And it'll tell you where your lines to be. Other factors, however, can affect the length of your line. Wind conditions, obviously, the windier it is, um, and the wave conditions, if it's windy and wave, the boat's going to be moving around, they need more room. So you need a longer line. Okay? Bigger boats tend to need a longer line as well, because there's at least one dead spot in the line, where, I mean, thing is, when you're running on Optimus Regatta, the, they will just all sit here, head to wind, like this, all the way along the line. And they don't need any extra space, because they all wait till it's five seconds to go, they bear away and they're off. A big boat, of course, doesn't. A big boat will take a run in. And he's going to be coming in on his lay line here, and if he really cuts it fine, he's going to miss your committee boat by five feet. And that's where he can start. So the area from there to there is completely dead on your line. So if you've included that in your line length, you haven't got enough. And then you've got a three, a, a three or four foot, five foot swell, and the boats are rolling up and down like this, and their masts are going like that, and they don't want to be as close to each other, so you need a much longer line. So various factors can indeed affect the length of the line. The other one is current. Assume for a moment that the current is operating from the committee boat towards the pin end. Even the boats who are setting up on the committee boat are going to get pushed down towards the pin end. And so what happens is a race officer, you see that happening, and you see that there's a lot of bunching down at the pin end, and there are two possibilities for that. One is your line's biased at the pin end. The other is that the current is pushing them down. And if the current is pushing them down, the answer is you probably lengthen your line a bit, because it's not fair. And this is all about fair racing. It's all about being fair to the competitors, setting something which is fair. Generally speaking, Charlie, Charlie. Yeah. yeah. Um, can you go back to the previous uh, slide on the line? Please? Yeah. If there are different uh, classes, or if it is a suit race where there are different classes for racing, so does it mean that professionally the race officer officers supposed to move the line uh, for the well, yeah. The question is, with different classes starting at different times, would you move the length of the line? The answer is probably not, because it's going to slow it down, and that's not going to be very, very, very much fun for anybody. And indeed, even at the Olympics, they start with longer lines. So you set it up for your long, for your biggest cars. So you set it up to your longest line. Otherwise, it's going to take forever, because you know moving a line is a not an easy, not an easy job. It can take a few minutes. Certainly, moving the length, you can move your angle relatively quickly, but you can't move your length. Um, General rule 
is that we set the line, I think I cut out a factor. General rule is we set the line to the sailing wind. Okay? You don't have to worry about where the mark is. You're not interested in the mark when you're setting a line, you're interested only in the star line. And that's why it's critical to be watching your boats so that you know the angles that they're tacking at. General rule, set the start line to the sailing wind. Okay, that means looking at the boats, set them so they're going across it at 45 degrees. There was a long time ago a rule that you used to set it at five, with a five degree pin end bias. That is no longer the rule. And the reason is that it creates all sorts of problems, particularly punching down the pin end and all sorts of other problems as well. And it can have a, a significantly detrimental effect. So now we try and set a square line. It's square to the sailing wind. The times when you don't do that is when you put a bit of bias on it. Deliberately, for example, the tide. So, if you have got the current all pushing them down the line, what you might do to encourage the boats to come further up is put a bit of committee end bias on it. Because that will persuade the boats. What you're trying to do is persuade the sailors that actually they want to be starting at the committee end. Actually what happens, of course, is they all start, start lining up for the committee end, but then they get pushed down the line. So there are instances when you do put a little bit, little bit of bias on this, but it's usually for tactical reasons. The other reason that you do it, as I say, is tactics. Uh, and this is a classic one at Lama. Um, it, it, if you're a sailor and you've got a start line, I mean, on, on, on this thing, it's pretty obvious which side of the course you're going to go. You're going to go right, because it's in the strongest tide. Oh, that's against you. So, sorry, you're going, to go, you're going to go there. It's in the strongest tide. Uh, it's in the weakest tide, and the tide's against you, so you want to get out of the tide. Okay? So, what's going to happen here, because of this, this is a bay, by the way. Uh, this is the land. Um, what's going to happen here, if you set an equal line, everybody's going to bunch down this end because they all want to go into the bay. And it's going to be mayhem at the pin end. So what you do is you drop the pin end down a bit, give them a bit of starboard end um, bias, and see if you can encourage them back. And there's sort of competition amongst the race officers sometimes, see how much you actually need to encourage the fleet. And what you're looking for on a start line is a fleet that's evenly spread across the start line. Okay, so there's boats all the way down. The gate I mentioned, minimum width of the gate, remember the gate is the two boys on the one we lose. Minimum width of the gate is one zone plus one boat length plus one zone. Now do you all know what a gate is? A gate basically gives the sailors a choice to go around the left hand side or, or, or the right or the right hand side. And you've got to set them a, 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 you've got to set them upright. The minimum width for a gate is a zone because you need a zone around each point for, for mark room purposes. And you probably need a boat length in the middle just to separate keep the zone separate. So it's actually much smaller than you think. So that's basically what you're trying to um, set it up as. Usual width, eight to ten boat lengths is the usual width for a gate for a gate. So for optimists, that's about 50 feet. Um, for uh, Genix, that's quite a long way. <laughs> okay. And the angle is the same principles as the star line. But you set it in the same way as the star line. As a race officer, you're not going to be too concerned about it. If you're a mark player on a race team, then you are concerned about it because you've got to know what you're doing. Okay. Right. Standard procedures on the. I'm going to run through this. See how many of these we've got. Not. Standard procedures pre start. Um, first of all, remember that it's a team. And, and, and you know, it really is a critical part of it. You've got to make sure everybody's talking the same thing. Brief the team up properly. Make sure they all know what they're doing and they're all comfortable. Um, make sure you know how many boats are around. If you, if on the entry form, particularly if you're dealing with dinghies and kids, make sure if you can, you know how many boats are out. Because you know, if on the entry form there are 20 kids and in fact you've only got 19, 
there's one kid who's got lost on his way. And you are, as the race officer, responsible for safety. So you've got to try and know these things. Um, obviously, monitor the wind direction and strength. The way that you, you do that about every five minutes, that so you can draw little graphs, and I'm sure a lot of you do this when you're racing anyway. Um, but you do want to know, as a race officer, you want to know, is it flicking back every five, ten minutes? How's, what's, what's the fluctuations of the wind? Is it an oscillating wind? Is it gently tracking right? Because if it's gently tracking right, I'm more likely to set my boy off further to right than, 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 than I am to the left of the course. How's the oscillations going? And the oscillations are quite important because when it's two minutes to go to the start and you've got a big kick on to the right, you want to know, is it likely to come back before the start? Or have I got to check, have I got to postpone this and delay the start? because I've got it now and I'm going to have to start with But there's those sorts of considerations um, that you need, to, uh, you need to, uh, to consider. You set up the boat to make sure that all the systems are in place and all the flag flags are in order. And they're all there. Um, what are you going to do if the flags aren't there? We had, uh, you know, I've certainly seen it where people have tried to run a back flag and they don't have a back flag for it. Can't do it. So you've got to make sure that you've got all the bits that you need. Communicate with the other courses and do radio checks. Time checks are quite important. In fact, on the big regattas, it's critical. On the big regattas, I use GPS time. I don't just use my watch because my watch might be wrong. And it might be different to Ambrose's watch, who's saving. Or it might be different to somebody else's watch. Um, and maybe hundreds of times. So I always use GPS time. And I synchronize my watch to GPS time and I tell the competitors that's what I'm going to do. So when I have a warning signal at 10.55, It'll be 10.55 GPS time, and all the boats who have synchronized their watches to GPS time can count down to the warning signal, and they all know. And that's the best way to do it, because then everybody knows what it is that you're doing. And you're all the time trying to be fair to the competitors, give them a fair and decent race. Starting procedure. This one's very, very small. Sorry about that. Um, this is basically giving you a warning, and the reason I put it up is that it, th th there is certain documentation on the boats, uh, on the committee boats and we're trying to introduce standard documentation to help you to do it. But the reason for just identifying this is just to identify some of the facts. The first is the orange flag. Now the orange flag generally signals that the, um, that the start of the committee boat is on station and is ready to go. There's been a change in ISAF policy. We've always, at the club, what we've always done is get to the air race area, drop your anchor and hoist the orange flag. Okay, that's what the club generally does. ISAF has changed its policy and now we're using the orange flag as a warning signal for a series of races. So in the sailing instructions now, it will normally say the orange flag will be hoisted with one sound signal, not less than four minutes before the warning signal of, or the parish signal of the first, um, no, the warning signal of the first start, in a sequence of starts. So essentially, uh, in fact, what most race officers tend to do is they tend to put it up five minutes before the warning signal. So it effectively becomes like the old 10-minute gun. But it's only an old 10-minute gun at the first of a sequence of starts. And it's basically there just to warn people what's going on. It, the, the flag goes up, there's one sound, and it says in five minutes time, you're going to have a warning signal, so start paying attention. Put your sandwiches away. Um, the AP flag we'll know about, and then these ones at four minutes is the, uh, the P flag, the I flag, and the black flag. And those are your preparatory signals, and they tell the, 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 the sailors what it is that they're going to do. Basic concept with a, with, a, with a flag, it comes from the Navy. When it goes up, it's telling you what is about to happen. When it comes down, that command, represented by the flag, is executed. So it's the bringing down the flag, which is the critical bit, generally speaking. Okay? These forms are quite good because you can write down the actual time cells you want to the length and time of the race. Associated actions, uh, very often you have to display the course. Sometimes, in certain instructions, it requires you to display the angles, the first mark. All those things, you've got to know what those obligations are. You do not need your start line in on the five minute gun. Your start line can go in on the four minute gun. Okay? Um, you also, contrary to popular belief, do not need your window mark in. You do not often need your window mark in even at the start. It's sensible to have it. You do need it in if you've got a back flag or an I flag. But if you've got a, just going on a B flag, 
We don't even need to win the market at the start. But, of course, sensible to do it. Starting procedures. P is in default, no penalties. I rule, bit of a nightmare, I suggest nobody uses it if you can possibly help it. Z flag is even more complicated, and black flag is the one to watch. They just introduced in the rules this year a new one which I won't trouble you with, which is called the U flag, which is pretty similar to the black flag, but not quite the same. Because uh, the U flag doesn't. The black flag, if there's a general recall and you were over, you're not allowed to restart the race. Um, on a U flag, you now are allowed to restart the race. So the U flag is being used with the same deterrent effect, or nearly the same deterrent effect as the black flag. So those are the things you want to decide as a policy. As a policy, I always go with the P flag first because that's the fair way to do it. I generally will say to people, particularly the pushy fleets like the optimists, I will then generally say to them, if I have to do a general recall, I will go to the black flag. And I do that as a matter of policy, then then straight into the black flag. And once I've done that, the next race, I'll start on the P flag. And then if they're over, if they're doing a general recall, I'll go straight to the black flag again. And that's the, generally the policy that we operate. Sometimes you have to go straight to the black flag. If they're all pushing it and you're a bit pushed for time, you've got to make sure you get your races away, then you just say, sorry guys, black flag straight away. Okay? The reason you don't go to the black flag straight away is it's not really very fair to the sailors because they're all having, you know, they're all trying to get a decent stop and they're all trying to see what they can do. So this is a one with a bit of animation, I think. Um, right, one minute before the start. Oh, I see what's happening. Yeah, one minute before the start, um, you can see that if he goes over, nothing happens. He just pulls back. And what that, that, the effect of that means he can go up over the line and he can dip back and he can do all those things. You need not worry about the guys over the line when you're calling the line up until the last, the last little bit. The I flag is a bit different. That's called around the ends rule. Now, if you are... Uh, personally, I think it's a nightmare to use. I don't use it. Um, if you are um, over the line or its extensions, one minute before the line, but one minute before the gun, then you have to go round the end. Okay? And from a race officer's perspective, it's a nightmare because it means you need to watch the extensions. And it's very difficult and complicated. So, I think we're going to see. Yeah, you have to go around the end. Yeah. Let's see how we're doing this. Black flag, this is when you do need the, um, the women market because you have to be able to draw a triangle up to the women mark. And if you are anywhere in that triangle, you're disqualified from the race. Anywhere that, you can sail around here and up to there, provided you haven't gone into the triangle. But the moment you go into a triangle, then um, you're disqualified from the race and can't restart it. So it's quite a serious event. It's also very complicated from the race officer's perspective because he's got to be watching very hard. You've got to keep an accurate number of the boats. And if there's a general recall, you've got to write down all the boats, you've got to display them. There's a whole bunch of procedures going on in the event of a general recall. If you don't get them right, you'll, you'll, you'll end up getting wrong. So be a bit careful about using the black flag. And uh, if you can avoid it, I probably would. Starting procedures. Let's have a quick look at that. Um, see what we get to in a second. Yeah. A again, note the team. Okay? You're all doing slightly different things on the start boat. The line officer will be one of the people on the start boat identified, and he's standing about a metre behind the line. Behind, behind the line, and he's watching it. And he's got a dictaphone in his hand, and what he's doing is he's run, he runs a commentary, like a horse racing commentary. And he's saying things like, I've got four hundred, number 423, he's two row lengths behind the line, he's creeping up on the line, it, just beyond him is 524, he's three row lengths behind, he's coming up to the line, there's 15 seconds to go. That type of commentary, he turns around, he looks, I've got number 21 coming in over my shoulder. He's just coming to the box, he's half a boat behind the line, he's now over the line. 23 is over the line, he's just dropped back, so 23 is clear. 
And that's all put into the dictaphone. You start that dictaphone running a minute and a half before the start. And you commentate the whole thing. And the idea is that if there's a claim for redress, and there are frequently claims for redress, you take your dictaphone into the protest room and you listen and the jury listens to it. And they have to get a complete picture of what it is that you were doing and what happened on the line. And that's the reason for the line commenting. The line recorder is there with a piece of paper writing down what the line commentator has said. So you've got a hard copy and you've got a dictaphone. And that way you've got and then you can tie it up. And it gets complicated when you've got five or six votes over the line. Sometimes the records don't match, and that's what we really want to work out what we're doing. That's why the dictaphone is important. Can we listen back to it, etc.? The race officer is he's also standing watching the line, but he's not doing the commentating one. His job is to have an overall view. His job is, for example, to be looking at are they all bunched down the pin end? Have I had a 25 degree shift of wind, which makes my line massively unfair and starts up? Is it all going okay? What's, are there any problems with it? So he's looking around it, but in the last probably 10 seconds, he will then have to start concentrating on the line. It might be a bit more than 10 seconds, 20 seconds, something like that. He'll start focusing entirely on the line and who's over because it's the race officer's decision as to whether the line is clear or whether they're over and if it's over who it is. And it's his decision as to whether there's an individual recall or a general recall. And he's got five seconds to make that decision. Because if the flag doesn't go up within five seconds, we always say four, but the, the case source is about five. If, 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 if the individual recall doesn't go up within five seconds, then you're entitled to redress as a seven. So you've got to get it right. So tape recording, writing down, and the race officer keeping himself free to make that decision. And what I do when I'm doing it, I've got a guy at the pin end, I'm on the telephone to the pin end, I'm listening to the guy who's standing next to me as the line recorder, and I, with him, I then make a decision. Is it a general or is it a, 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 an individual? I don't always know every vote of an individual, because I will say quickly to the pin end, I'll be talking to the pin end at the time, I'll say, there's a boat close towards you who's over, I can't see his number, have you got it? He'll say yes, and then I know that we've got that guy over. So you've got its communication amongst your team, it's critical in these events. Then they're off, and you breathe a sigh of relief, and you say that was a good start. So what do you do? Do you sit back and then come to see, or do you actually sit and watch the race? The answer is, of course, you sit and watch the race. You're looking for the fleet, you're trying to work out how they're racing. Is it equal? Is it fair? Has there been a big wind shift? Are there boats going on both sides of the beat? Are they jiving correctly? How long are they taking? That sort of question. Quite an important question. How long? If it's taken, you might have a time limit up to your first mark. Are they going to meet it? Are they going to, or am I going to have to abandon it? Has the wind died? Is it completely crammed out? I'm going to have to abandon the race. All those sorts of questions are going through your mind constantly. And you'll sometimes, you'll sometimes see me just sitting on the coach roof with an old croucher, and I'm just sitting there watching. Not talking to anybody, and they know this existence, but you're just watching the race, trying to measure it, timing it, working out all those sorts of things. Um, commercial traffic, obviously, and, and then setting the correct course. Uh, don't uh, don't worry too much about setting the correct course. Generally speaking, we let the sailors monitor their own debates and have their own fights. We don't get involved in protesting against sailors if we can possibly help. Fairness of the race, that's what it's all about, which is why sometimes you have to abandon. Sometimes you don't abandon even when it gets a little bit unfair because you're looking at the overall regatta. But if the race gets unfair, don't be fighting for your calendar. So that's what you do. And prepare for the next race, of course. Finishing line. Uh, finishing line, seven boat lengths long, 90 degrees to the last mark around the cans, 90 degrees to the sailing wind for beats and runs, and they cross it in the direction of the last mark. Uh, as I say, that gave rise to one interesting incident at the HKS Africa last earlier in the year when they were crossing in both directions. Quite how that happened, I'm not quite sure. Um, but it doesn't have the finish line doesn't have to be very long. And generally speaking, a shorter finishing line is better than a longer finishing line. Now, question: What do you do on the finishing? Starting is easy. Okay. 
starting is easy because if, if, if you get it wrong, you've got a panic button. And the panic button is your AP flag. You can put that up at any stage. And people do. And you can put it up for all sorts of reasons. You put your AP up. Generally, you should be putting the AP up if it's your fault. Okay? You general recall if it's the sailor's fault. But if it's, a, if, it's, if, if it's your fault as a race officer, if you've got a bad line or whatever, you mistime it, all those sorts of things, you AP it. If you've got a big windshield, you AP it. Finishing is completely different. You only get one chance at finishing. Okay? And they sell a two hour race, and if you get it wrong, they're not going to buy you a drink in the bar. Alright? So you've just got to really, really focus on finishing. It's critical to get it right. That is why you want two finishing records. Don't have somebody sitting on the committee boat drinking a can of Coke when they're all finishing. Have everybody on the boat doing something because if you get it wrong, the sailors are not going to be happy. Actually, quite often they know there is a story of a bunch of kids in optimists and they lost, I don't know how it happened, but they lost the finishing records over the side of this, this race and they, didn't, they thought, what the hell are we going to do now? So they got all the kids into, that, into the, uh, the hangar after the measurement room and they said, right kids, here's a game line up in the order that you finish in. And these kids all lined up, and they all knew, absolutely, they knew where they finished. And they just went down, what's your name? What's our number? What's our number? <laughs> and that was a finishing list. Okay? So these people know where they are, where they're finishing. So, you, you know, if you get it wrong, they're going to know. And they're going to come and tell you. Um, because they know the boats where they're next to you. So, please, please, try and get that bit right. So I have two recorders. On, on, on the boats, you shouldn't really have anybody sitting around doing nothing. Of course, it's easy in a big boat fleet on an hour and a half race where they're finishing five minutes apart. There's one boat, oh, there's Joey, it's just coming in, and then you finish it. Doesn't take two of you to write that down. And then five minutes later, the next one comes in, you know, and that's easy. But in a fleet of dinghies, you know, you can get them coming in absolutely bang, 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 bang. I don't know who was at the China Cup a couple of years ago, we had a dreadful thing. We should have abandoned the race, frankly, but we didn't. And we had a dreadful finish. And I think the whole fleet finished within about 35 seconds. And it was a nightmare. And, you know, and, anyways, but we managed it somehow. But the only way that we did it, ultimately, was because we had a tape recording. So we had, in fact, there were only two of us trying to finish everybody on that occasion. But we had somebody writing it down, and we had somebody on a tape recording. Of course, on a handicap fleet, you've got to write down the time and the cell number because the time's important. On a one design fleet, time is important. You only need first and last. Um, so you've got to make sure and only make a record of what you see. So what, basically what you do is you have a line caller who's just calling it and he, all he does is call. He has a dictaphone and all he does is call. And then he has two people writing what he calls. And they only write down what he says. So they don't look up, you know, with their heads right down here. Because if they look up, they'll write down something different to what he says. I guarantee you, they'll write down something different. So the recorders don't look up. They look only at their sheets. And they write down only the best recorders of people who don't like say. Because they don't want to look. And they just write it down. Then you have another team who's looking at it from a slightly different angle. Maybe. It doesn't have to be exact. And he writes, he calls what he thinks is going to be the order. And then he has a recorder who writes down what he's saying. And then maybe you have a third team looking at it on Kelly Six from below. You have all these teams all looking at a complicated finish. And then you've got the wonderful task of trying to marry it all up again. And I don't think I've ever done a regatta where there hasn't been some question. Ever. And that's why your dictaphones are critical. Okay? And the worst thing you can have is parents and kids on the boats who suddenly get all excited and go, Go on, Johnny, go on, Johnny, go on, Johnny, and you can't hear what the hell anybody is saying. It, it becomes a nightmare. Anyway, please work really hard at finishing because it is really, really important. Why can't the finishing be video instead of video? Um, the reason is because videos foreshorten um, the perspective. You can't tell the perspective. You can't tell the angles, and you don't know. It's 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 not according to the experts. It, it's not um, a sufficiently accurate 
Uh, and you can only see what is what is in the field of vision. You can't see what's developed up to it. And, and the experts, that's the clever people, the international judges and all that lot, they have all decided that videos aren't reliable for that reason. So although videos are used, you cannot use it. I've seen people use it, but you can't take it into the process room. So frankly, you're better off probably not using it because you start to rely on something if you're not entitled to rely on it. Sorry? Not even a... Uh, oh, I don't know whether like, America's cut, but uh, in the process room, you're not allowed to use it. I'm not sure they do video it, and then they'll go back and look, and you know, they, they need all sorts of mathematics that they can use to use it. Um, but but it's, it's not permissible in the process room. Um, <coughs> right, next thing, I've mentioned your um, postponement plan. This is your panic button. Okay, use it at any stage, but only use it before the start. You cannot postpone a race that is starting. So if the, if the signal is gone, the start signal is gone, you can't use it. But it is your panic button. I've stopped a race, i stopped to start three seconds before the start, just because it was wrong. So you can use it right up to the start. And, and do. Miss timing, flags fall down, etc., etc., all that kind of stuff. And you can use it. Goes up with one hoot. Individual recall on call side of the line. And you have to shout individual recall flag. And this is critical. Very often we have this not on a habit, we have it on a stick. You've got to fly it. It is the only sound signal in the whole of race management that is critical. You, without a sound signal, it's not a valid call. And, and what you do is you, you basically you make the sound signal and you fly, fly the flag. And you have to fly it forwards. The reason is, obviously, the sailors are racing. By within five seconds, you're behind them. So the sound signal is critical to make them look at you. And then they look up and they see the flag. You get the procedure wrong, they'll be redressing it. Okay? So essentially, you've got four seconds to get that sound signal and the flag going up. You have to identify the boats that are over. I'm clicking through these real quick because otherwise we're getting. Well, you record it. Now, <laughs> that last one is absolutely critical. How many people have called an OCS and then forgotten to watch a few returns? Okay? It does happen, quite often. Uh, and uh, you've got to watch. And if you've got four boats OCS, it gets even more complicated because you've got to watch all four of them. Did he come back? Oh, I thought I saw him. You know, and also, watch who you're asking. Because sometimes boats go over and they dip back, but they don't quite make it. So somebody on the boat says, oh yeah, he came back. But they saw him dip. They didn't see him actually come back when he was OCS. So keep your eye on the boats that are OCS. And you've got to work really hard in doing it. Leave display for four minutes if they don't return, and then you can take it down. And then you remove it without a sanction. You do finish boats that are OCS. You give them a finish place, but you mark them as OCS. You have to record their finish. Okay? General recall is two sound signals. That's when you can't identify all the boats. Sometimes you get a small fleet, and it's pretty easy. Um, but you can have just one boat blocking you. And you know there's one other boat down the far end. You haven't got a pin in man. You know there's one other boat down the far end, but you can't see him. Well, the fair thing to do then is to call a missus, uh, call a general recall. Because otherwise the guy at the pin end's got an advantage. Try not to do it if you can help it. I generally call, do general recalls if it's the sailor's fault. If it's my fault they're over, and it might be because I've got a bias line, and they're all bunched, or they'll be pushed over by the side, I'll AP it. If it's their fault, I'll let it go in our general lift, and I'll go to the back track. But you have to identify, um, you have to know that you can't identify them all. And it's the first substitute, and it's to be used when there's several, there you go. Short the course, we all know that. That's S flag. Display it at rounding mark, and then we shorten the course usually at the mark. I'm clicking through these pretty quickly because some of these are pretty easy. Um, you have to put the class flag up, the class that you're shortening, um, if, you, uh, if you've got multiple classes. It's quite important in our race. 
is there a general principle of stopping in court? So when is when is the right time to do that, or is it up to the discretion of the no, it's up to the discretion of the race officer. Personally, if you can alter the course length, if you're feeling confident enough to do that, alter the course length. But it, basically, if the wind dies and you can see that you're not going to hit a time limit, then you should, because you want to get the race into the time limit if you can. Change the course. <clears throat> That's flag C. Um, I, I don't need. To, I'm not going to trouble you too much with that. But flag C is where there's a wind shift. What you can do is before the boats get onto the next leg, you can actually alter the leg. Um, in the laser worlds, two years ago, they had all four. I don't quite know how they do this, but I think they had three of the four marks on the move at any one time. Um, and, and that's how complicated it can be. And that's for the race officer knows what he's doing, so I don't suppose we can kind of do that for them. Missing mark, that does happen. You see it go walking. Well, you could use a boat to go and sit as the missing mark. Then he displays flag M. Uh, again, you don't need to, I, I've never had to use that, but it's just useful to know that you can if you do it. Restarting, you probably do need to just know this. Restarting is after a postponement. You take the postponement down, and one minute later, the warning signal goes. And that's in the racing rules. So you can't just take it down and think, well, we'll start in a few minutes. It stays up there, comes down with one boot, one minute later, you have the warning signal for the next race. For a general, it's the same. One minute afterwards is the warning signal. Now that's slightly different in harbour racing because the standard SIs have changed that slightly. And what, what happens generally in, 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 in lots of classes is everybody just jumps down the queue and the recalled fleet steps back into the front of the queue. That's different to the way they do it in the harbour at the moment. So at the moment you're in the harbour, you go around the back of the queue. After racing, let me finish. After racing, protests. That they do happen. You can't protest the race committee. Are you with me? So nobody can protest against the race committee. All they can do is claim redress. So when somebody comes up to you as a race officer and says, "I'm going to protest you, Mr. Race Officer," you say, "Oh no, you're not. You're going to claim redress because I got it wrong." Um, but it does happen, and you know we all make mistakes, and that's fine. And the answer is going to um, uh, you just going to tell the truth. I mean, you know, we're, we're all we're, we're doing our best here. Yeah? Everybody makes mistakes. The difference between the race off committee and the sailors is that every single sailing boat makes mistakes in the race course, but only they know about it. Unless, of course, they're really cocktail. It's been a voice in which case a lot of people know about it. But every single boat makes a mistake. The skipper or the tactician gets it wrong, but only that boat knows. The race officer gets it wrong, and every boat knows. Okay? So that's the, that's the difference. Well, that's why there's a bit more pressure, and that's why actually we're going through the education process, and if you step up to all these levels, You'll get, you know, you'll really understand and you won't be worried about it because it doesn't matter. And if you get it wrong, you go to the redress room and you tell them what happened and you tell them how it worked and the, the judges say, okay, well, you got that wrong, we'll give this boat an extra 30 seconds on this time, or something like that. And it's all very simple. And don't let the competitors run on you and you leave the decision to the protest committee. Okay? You don't, you can't make the decision yourself. You did what you did, it's the protest and the protest committee or the jury. I have to decide. After the racing, quick debrief. Get your feedback from competitors. Go into the bar. Hopefully they'll buy you a drink. Um, you know, they'll say thank you. That's a good race. You know, enjoy it. Good course. All that kind of stuff. Um, so do get feedback and do you know sort of work on it to see what you can improve because we can all improve. No question about that. Um, I'm not going to worry too much about this. Thing is. I, mean, I suppose you need to know about it. Keelboats pretty much look after themselves. You don't need to worry about the things you do need to worry about. In the, in the Yacht Club, we've got a lot of coaches and a lot of very experienced people out there with the dinghies. So talk to them. It's too windy. Or you, I mean, for example, there's a 25 knot wind limit for 29 knots. Because you break, you break boats above 29 knots. For an optimist, you can send it out in 40 knots. It doesn't matter that they don't break. And the kids will love it. Something. Anyway, not all of them. Um, so, you know, talk to the coaches and find out. But you have to be much more aware of safety with kids. You've got to be aware of, of the sun, of the length of time they've been out there. In the UK, there's a policy they're not allowed to be out for more than six hours. So there's, there's all sorts of policies that you just, you just need to be slightly aware of. Racing conditions, um, pressure on the youngsters. When it goes wrong, there's a lot of these, I think. 
I'm not going to run through them. Big wind shifts. I mean, all, all of these happen. Okay? You know, these sorts of things, particularly fishing boats coming through, or a cruiser, or a big commercial boat, come through the star line. Well, this is where your AP comes in. Stick an AP up. Don't try and do something, you know, don't, don't be clever. If it's going wrong, put your AP up. That's what it's all about. Community boat moves. Um, you know, it happens. Anchors drag. Everybody knows it drags. And don't worry about it. Just say, okay, sorry, we'll AP it, we'll relay, we'll do it again. Uh, course incorrectly displayed, that one's happened to me a few times. Why isn't it working? Finish line too shallow, I don't know if it's going to happen in Hong Kong. Um, flags don't go up or flags fall down. Now, I've certainly had that happen. Somebody didn't tie them up properly. So you put your you put your glass flag up, which is of course your starting signal, not comes undone and the thing falls down. Well, what do you do then? Well, the answer is you wait here and you don't worry about it. You just say sorry. Or the timer is lighting his cigarette at the time when he was meant to be using the gun and putting the flag up and he misses it. Okay, sorry, we'll AP, we'll start again. And nobody minds that rather you get it right. But all of these things, uh, believe me, all of these things happen. Results confuse emissions of lost boats. Yeah, that happens too. Um, but uh, try and avoid it. You can see sickness, uh, that's uh, that certainly happens on Keller 6 out of Lama. Um, uh, the, the answer is, if, don't be frightened of taking seasick pills. Uh, I keep seasick pills in my bag and I hand them out freely and I offer them to anybody. The other thing is drink. Drink, uh, not alcohol usually, because that makes you worse. But drink lots of water, keep, keep properly hydrated. But it does happen, and if it does, don't worry. But if somebody's going to get ill, have a think about how you're going to cover what they're doing. Um, Tiny error noticed after the start. Now that's interesting. What do you do when you realise, oh, we started a minute early? Well, what do you do then? All the boats went, and you then go and make a decision as what to do. It happens. And to be honest, it probably depends on the level of the racing that you're dealing with. If it's a regatta, then it's an important regatta that abandon the race. Because how about, it, they might have started, but one guy might have been 10 yards behind the line, more 10 yards more behind the line, but he would have been if he got the minute right, because he realised you, that you got it wrong. And he was trying to catch up, so you don't actually know whether it's fair. So the actual, the fair thing to do is to restart. Very often at club level, you might not bother because everybody wants to get home at the bar and they've already had 20 minutes racing and they don't really care. So you've got to make a, make a call. The critical thing is recognise your problems and admit your mistakes. Because, you know, they're easy to do, they're easy to make. And it's not you as the race officer, it'll be somebody in your team, sort of no blame culture, but it was his fault. You know, and that, that's the way to deal with this. And no blame, okay, that's what's happened, no problem, let's say B, let's abandon the race, let's start again. Unless you lost the results, in which case let's try and work out how that works. So, but it's a let's work it out rather than anything else. And you deal with the issues, obviously. Ah, oh, and that's the end of the story. So there you go, there's a very, very rapid gallop through race management. I, I managed to cut 30 slides out of this. The level one course lasts for four evenings of three hours an evening. Um, and the level two course lasts for three days. So it can get pretty complex. You can see, you can begin to see the sort of complexities that we're beginning to deal with. And what we're trying to do is teach people how to deal with those complexities. It is a very interesting thing. You also get a fantastic view of racing. And you don't have to be a great second in order to do it. But I hope you found that relatively interesting. And I hope that it sort of encourages some of you to come along and, 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 and start to learn a little bit more about it. Anybody got any questions? Stunned silence. Thank you very much. <laughs>